so Antje um, has a joint appointment between ECMWF and the University of Oxford, where she's a senior research fellow. Um, Antje is interested in the predictability um, of the Earth system on a range from uh, timescales from days to weeks, months, and longer. Um, she also works uh, with stochastic pomodorizations, um, had, has worked with multi-models, and is flittering up and down the time and spatial scales, a bit like me. And uh, I'm very delighted to um, uh, uh, introduce you and look forward to your talk on decadal scale variations. Thank you, Judith. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be at this meeting, and it's a pity we don't see each other in person. And uh, when I joined ECMWF many years ago, Judith was there, and then we overlapped for quite some time, and there are several similarities between us, and it's nice to get back in touch every now and then. The same with Anish. Anish was in Oxford in our group um, years back, and it's, it's so lovely to, to see you both working together and sort of joining in. Anyway, um, I'll start sharing my screen, yeah. Can, can you see that? Yes, yes perfect. Okay, so um, let me arrange these funny bars here. Do I see something? So uh, I talk a little bit about the seasonal forecast of the 20th century, and this is, is quite a wide ranging topic. So I thought for, for this lecture here, the focus is on the questions uh, of the North Atlantic, the extratropical circulation, in particular, how confident we are about predictability estimates of the winter NAO on seasonal timescales. And I would like to acknowledge um, the contributions over many years from colleagues in, at ECMWF and in Oxford, like especially Chris O'Reilly, um, Tim Palmer, Dave McLeod, Damien de Crimea, Tim Stockler, and Stephanie Johnson. They all contributed in one way or the other um, to, to this work and we're still collaborating on many of these things. So when we talk about seasonal forecast uh, of the extra tropics, then um, we, what we really aim to do is we aim to forecast a distribution that is sufficiently discriminating the interannual signal from the climatological background distribution. And uh, the schematics below indicate two situations on the left hand side, perhaps what would be ideal, where the blue line indicates we have a climatological distribution. And then our forecast distribution is ideally quite narrow and it's moved away from the climatology and it's, it's ideally also um, very much centered around the observations. But then if we look at our problem in the exotropics and, and here in Europe, especially, we often face this situation that is quite different. So our forecast distribution is not necessarily any narrower than the, the climatological distribution. Also the shift away from climatology can be quite subtle. It's not that much really. And the observations um, very often is not at the center of this distribution at all. So it was, um, it was quite an exciting time the last, in the last decade or so for seasonal forecasting. And uh, you might have heard about um, the work from, from colleagues at the Met Office here in the UK, where um, they published a paper, this was in 2014, with, uh, which, which made headlines in, in this year on the left hand side, this is from the Times, the, the, the daily newspaper, with the headlines like forecasters crack the formula to predict long range weather. Which, which several of us made, uh, made us a bit surprised and uh, thought we missed something also. I mean, we have been working on this for quite a long time, but it all goes back to this paper by Adam Scave and colleagues from the Met Office who showed here, and the plot on the right um, indicates that, uh, forecasts of the winter NAO of their seasonal forecasting system had skill in the, for the ensemble mean correlation skill of 0.62 which, is, uh, which is, is, is quite high for the exotropics and that, that made these big headlines that with this glossy forecasting system, we can now predict uh, the, the state of the NAO quite well for the next winter. But we should say, I mean, there was lots of discussion about this paper and um, I just mentioned the fact that for instance, the data here, the orange lines are the, the dots are the ensemble members 
um, and the black line is the verification or the NAO index, um, the, the applied uh, calibration that is a little bit questionable and the reason for this is that the signal to noise ratio is really, really low. We have a lot of variability um, and noise, so to say, in the forecast and the signal that you want to predict the, the variability um, in the ensemble mean from year to year is, is, is really, it's really quite low. Um, just before I go on, I just want, I, I can't help but to say that um, it's not really the case that this was the first time um, uh, the, the, this, this level of skill was found. And um, here I show you something from at the top. It's a paper by from Wolfgang Müller and others. This was a time when Wolfgang did his PhD a long time ago, so you can see. And he was part of the Demeter project, which was a European project across several institutions, countries in Europe, to look at seasonal forecasts in a multimodal sense framework. And there, if you see, just look at the underlying values there, which shows the correlation skill for the NAO in winter. And uh, from the multimodal and the meter, we, ha we had levels that were even higher than the ones that the, the Metov has now reported, nearly 0.7. The, the reason I think at the time people didn't make make a big fuss about it is that um, we also notice that this skill depends very crucially on the period you're looking at. And as you can see, the, the high level of skill here, 0.7, uh, was for 1987 to 2001. But when the in the meter, they extended the handcars back to, to the late 1950s. And over that period, the skill disappeared. And that, that um, made people at the time quite wary. And here, the plot at, or the, the table at the bottom um, shows a sort of a more up-to-date analysis um, of both the Demeter data and then from the follow-on project from the ensembles project. And we notice a similar thing that if we look at the most recent decades, the skill was quite high, partly significant, but if we use the same model and extend the forecast period to, to include earlier decades, the skill went down a bit. So, um, let me go. Uh, just just um, to summarize here from, from what I've been trying to say, the seasonal forecast um, of weather and climate over the Euro-Atlantic region, especially, the, the are really difficult and they are difficult for several reasons. One is that this uh, signal to noise ratio uh, of the predictability in the exotropics is general quite low compared to the tropics, for instance. And the teleconnections from the tropical forcings, which is our, well, our major source of predictability, they are they're quite weak. If you think of the just the location where the tropical Pacific and Enzo is and where Europe is located, they have these signals have to travel a long way and there are lots of things that can go wrong and do go wrong. Um, and another big issue is the sample size. And this is something I'm gonna talk about more. We dealing here intrinsically with small sample size and these are mainly limited by the number of the observed seasons, which usually for operational seasonal forecasting centers is of the order of 30 year, could be 40, could be 20, roughly 30. It's not so much the size of the, the ensemble, the, the models, because we can create as many members as we want, but it's the verifying observations that is the limitation here. So estimates of seasonal predictability, skill, and also reliability suffer from quite, quite large uncertainties. And I'm sure you're all aware of um, the pitfalls that that, that you can um, experience by using uh, statistical metrics uh, measures and especially the correlation here. I just want to show this because it's such a nice example. It's a very famous um, example from the 70s. From this, it's called the Anscombe Square or the Anscombe, from the Anscombe paper, which indicates here um, four pairs of XY variables. And they are created such that all Y variables have the same mean and the same variance. The sample size here is 11 for each, so roughly the same order as our seasonal hindcast forecast data. And also the correlation between X and Y in all cases is 0.882 for all sample sizes. But you can see the distributions of these variables are very different. We have sort of a more normal distributed, well-behaved data set on the left hand side and then we have something that is perhaps more uh, non-linearly related on the second left. Then we have perhaps a perfect linear relationship except for one outlier, the third examples here, and then we have 
no relationship in all but one data points really. Um, and, and still all of these with small sample size give us a same high correlation, which is just a warning for everybody. And I'm sure you're all aware of this, uh, that we have to be cautious with such simple statistical measures because they can pretend um, a relationship that is not really supported in the data. So the problem I would like to talk about or the, the subject here is really, can we overcome these sampling problems by using substantially longer historical periods. And I'm going to talk about data sets where we explored exactly this substantially longer historical periods for seasonal forecasting for the, for the hindcast period. So will this solve our problems there? And a related question is then, how robust are seasonal skill estimates if they were tested during independent past hindcast periods, if we validate them there? And a, a specific focus here is, can seasonal forecast models successfully predict the interannual variability in earlier decades of, of the 20th century? The 20th century is our period that we, we use for these longer, longer hindcasts here. And then based on this, we, we might wonder what are the implications for future seasonal hindcasts? We always look at the, the, the hindcasts, um, but in the end, of course, we want to learn for, for our future, for actual predictions, forecasts. Um, and I think um, that understanding the success and also the limitations of predictions in the past with current generation of forecast model, this will increase our confidence in, in any of the really the future forecasts or the, the forecast of the future, seasonal forecast for today and for next year's forecast. This is really the motivation behind, behind all this. So let me let me go into a little bit of details what we did. So we we basically run two sets of seasonal hindcasts covering the 20th century and a little bit more. And one, the first set we did um, was we used the ESMWF uh, atmospheric model, but didn't couple it to to ocean and sea ice components, but just gave it prescribed SSTs and sea ice to see whether it produces anything that is reasonable for, for the 20th century, for especially for the beginning of the 20th century. And that was possible due to the, the advent of the um, long reanalysis from ECMWF, the atmospheric reanalysis of the 20th century, it's called ERA 20C. So that is a reanalysis of the atmosphere and land and the waves. And we use this to initialize and to force the model um, at the, at the, over the oceans and over the sea ice regions throughout the this, this 20th century. And then later on, when we, when we saw that this was quite successful and it does, does not completely um, screw up the system, and we, we, went, uh, we went to a fully coupled system where we, yeah, we run sort of the atmosphere together with the land, ocean, and sea ice components. And the initialization for these models was uh, for these hindcars was gratefully uh, possible because in the meantime, ERA 20C was uh, updated with a coupled reanalysis. So this is ECMWF's first coupled ensemble of reanalysis of the 20th century um, called CERA 20C. So all these simulations were done with a model cycle from, of the ECMWF model that sits between system four and system five, because it was done before system five and operational, but it's quite close to system five. It uses though the horizontal and uh, vertical resolution from system four, so it's the, the linear grid T255, and it uses a one degree ocean model similar to what um, system four used. We have a quite a large ensemble of these hindcasts with 50 man, 51 or for some study 25, perturbed ensemble members, and we run them for all the four major seasons uh, by initializing on four dates uh, each year, first of February, May, August, November, so we can cover then four months, uh, forecast the, the main seasons. Um, and we did that for the period from 1901, this is when the reanalysis started, including a forecast initialized in 2010. It gives us uh, 110 years of fine cast data, which is factor of three, roughly larger than, than the standard operational hindcast. 
The focus here will be on, on the winter time, but as I said, we have this for all the seasons here. And just to show you very briefly that, um, that these, these forecasts are not complete nonsense for the earlier parts of the century, we see here the global mean temperature in, in DJF for uh, red the simulations with prescribed SSTs and CIs, the atmosphere only simulations, and in blue, the fully coupled one. I should say, um, so this is this this is in, in this BUMS paper is indicated here. We compared this coupled and uncoupled simulations and we gave them names. So ASF 20C is the atmospheric seasonal forecast, the prescribed um, SST CIS ones, and CSF 20C is the coupled seasonal forecast of 20th century. And um, you'll come across these labels perhaps later on as well. So this looks all quite reasonable in terms of the long-term trends and variability, patterns of variability. Um, there are some discrepancies, but overall the picture is, is very encouraging. And for seasonal forecasting, of course, be very interested in, in, in the tropical Pacific because this gives us our major source of predictability from ENSO. So how do our ENSO our tropical Pacific simulations look like? And we look here at, um, the, the, the absolute SSTs in the top part of the plot and in the correlation skill uh, for ENSO forecast for the Nino 3.4 index um, for different start dates throughout the year and different simulations. So let me talk you through. So if we look at the top part, we see in the gray line, this is our observed um, temperature in that part of the central tropical Pacific. Uh, it has a seasonal cycle, as you can see, the peak is around May. And then we see in, in color, green, yellow, green, uh, red and blue, our different start dates initialized in uh, beginning of February. And then these are the dots here, are monthly means for February and, and the following uh, months. And uh, if you look at the legend here, we see that um, the, the uh, the dashed lines are the ones from system five, the operational ECMWF seasonal forecasting system. The dotted one are from our low resolution version of system five, or similar to system, five, this, yeah, the low resolution version from system five. And then CSF is our coupled forecasting system with this initialization from these um, long reanalysis that I just described. And you see, that we're doing okay with our way of initializing uh, the, the forecast. I should, I should say, I forgot this from the previous slide. The way these reanalysis re are created are such um, that they only assimilate in the atmosphere, the near surface data for sea level pressure and winds over the ocean, marine winds. They don't assimilate any satellite products. Um, they don't assimilate any upper air um, observations really, it's a bit like the 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 compo and uh, at all reanalysis in, in in the US, um, and for the coupled similarly atmosphere and for the ocean it assimilates uh, sort of three dimensional fields of um, temperature and salinity as as available. So. Um, if you look at the lower part of this plot for the correlation, the skill, how good are these forecasts? I hope I can convince you that, that our forecasts with our system, CSF system here, are not drastically different than any of the op either the operational or the low resolution operational system, which is what we should compare to because we know the resolution and so matters. And so, so we, we get a system, our sort of setup seems to be doing reasonably well. This is for the overlapping period from 81 to 2009. So this gives us quite some confidence. If you want to know how the spatial structure of our skill for the SST looks like, this is summarized here. And um, in, in plot A at the top uh, left, we see the performance um, of a low resolution system five, the operational forecast, but there's a low resolution system and low resolution means same resolution basically or similar resolution as our long hindcast. And in B, panel B, we see the operational system, the high resolution. And uh, in terms of SSTs, um, the overall the picture is very similar. There are some differences here and there, and I'm not going to talk too much about those. It's just to give you an idea what the impact of resolution here is. And then in panel C, we see 
the same uh, plot correlation uh, maps for our CSF20C, the long hindcast, again verified for the same period in order to be fair in the comparison. So you see between those that they, they, they have sort of spots of skill in the SSTs um, in DJF here, uh, roughly the same places. It looks fairly similar. So it gave us lots of confidence that, that our forecast uh, globally, not only for the ENSO region, are, are doing okay. And then for comparison, if you compute the skill over the full period that we now have, 110 years, this is the plot at the bottom right in panel D. And there you see quite some differences. You still see good levels of skill for ENSO, and you, you do recognize sort of some of the teleconnections in terms of SST, in terms of skill in the North Pacific and in the Atlantic, parts of the the Indian Ocean, but, but they're a bit reduced and we'll come to this, this later on a bit more in detail. So if we talk about the exotropics and especially the NAO, then um, we're mostly looking at the flow in the, in the free troposphere and the jet variability here. So that here are similar plots as before, but now looking at the geopotential in 500 hectopascal, what's the skill there? Um, so the top plot is the operational skill for the period 81, 2009 from ECMWF. And you see the familiar picture that we get some skill in the extra tropics over the North Pacific and over North America, but the region of Europe and the North Atlantic is traditionally, it's very difficult to, to get um, high levels of skill there. And we, 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 yeah, it's a notoriously difficult area as I tried to explain in the beginning. So if you if you look at panel B and C now, these are from our long hindcast. Uh, in the one case, it's prescribed SSTs, panel B, and fully coupled in panel C for the same period. And you notice that the levels of skill also in the atmosphere, not only in the SSTs, TNZ500, are also very quite similar to the performance of the operational system. And then the two plots at the bottom show the Z500 skill, if you compute it over 110 years. And um, you see that we, we lose skill, the overall levels of skill are lower, um, but we do see a similar structure of, of a sort of areas with particularly low predictability, more skill over Europe and higher in, in other parts of the extra tropics and towards the North Pacific and North America here. So this brings me now really to the NAO. I don't think I need to say much about the NAO as a mode of variability in the North Atlantic region. Um, the index we use here, just briefly, is based on an EOF approach for Z500 over, over that part of the world. And if we compute the skill, how our um, forecast model in DJF is able to reproduce the, the, the NAO index, we end up for the last um, 30 years with a correlation skill of 0.44. So this would be a comparable value to the one that I mentioned from the SCAVE et al paper that made the headlines, they had 0.6. So our system uh, gives 0.44 here, which is, which is within the range that we get from, from all the slight variations of the ECMWF system. So, and then what we, what we see here, the curve, the blue curve, is really how that skill varies over time. If we move our window over which we compute the correlations, which is indicated by this gray, gray, gray bar at the top, if we move this by one year um, all the way through to the beginning of the century. And the way this is plotted is such that we have a 30 year window and we plot the correlation for that window at, uh, in the middle of that 30 year. Window. So, so the last data point um, represents the period from 81 to 2010, and the very first data point on the left hand side represents the period from 1901 to 1930. The, the grey thin lines give you some indication of error bars, confidence uh, intervals here. They are quite large, as you can see. But the interesting, um, the interesting behaviour that we found is that um, if we go back in time and, and, and compute the correlation skill for the NAO, we, we notice a period around roughly the middle of the century, 1950s, 1970s, where the skill is quite, uh, quite, quite a bit lower than 
either what we observed for the most recent periods, but also, and this is quite surprising, it was quite surprising for us, sorry, um, also for the earlier periods. So the scale goes down in the past, you, you might think, okay, um, you know, our initialization is, is not so good. We can't, you know, the model can't perhaps predict it so well because of that. But this argument is really is really not valid if you look at if we go even further in time to the 1920s, 1930s, where our observational coverage is arguably worse than in, in, in the mid-century decades, but our skill goes up again. And the skill in around the 1920s, 1930s, beginning of the century is, is as high as it is for the most recent decades. So this was quite, quite a surprise to us. Um, we then, this was for the, the uncoupled simulations. We did the same thing with the coupled simulations when they became available, the CSF 20C uh, simulations. And, and there, you know, we, we started off for the recent decades with a slightly larger level of skill, but given the error bars, you see that that is probably within the noise. And then see something, broadly speaking, similar, that we have a period where the skill is really um, not significant, don't have the error bars here, but it, it's, it's, it's basically disappearing at all in the around the 1960s, which of course with our 30 year window covers quite a lot of years on either side. And then again, for the earlier years, um, even the coupled forecasts may produce skill levels that, that much closer to what we see for the, for the recent uh, decades. Um, I think I should hurry up a little bit. So I, I'll go quickly over the next few plots. But here in green, you see the NAO index itself. And um, there's quite some interesting links there with the, the variability of the NAO and the predictability or the skill of, of our hindcast there. And um, in, in, in this paper, I should mention, maybe I should quickly go over this. We looked at some of these in, in a bit more detail. I just want to highlight here um, a few aspects. So the the ensemble mean correlation is, is a good first starting point, but we would like to explore the ensemble, the, the full probabilistic aspect as well. And the plot on the bottom left shows a rock skill score for different uh, thresholds. And with, with our large data set, we can do much more than is possible for, for shorter data sets. So we can uh, look at, we look here at the percentiles and 5% steps. So the left hand side are the very negative, extremely negative NAO indices. And uh, on the right hand side, the extremely positive ones. And we can see that for, especially for the extremes in both, both ends, the negative and the positive NAO indices, we get significant um, probabilistic skill in terms of the rock, rock area here. And um, we also noticed uh, on the right hand side here on the bottom, interesting behavior if we look at the upper and lower terciles and how sort of these, these phases of the NAO behave differently over time. So the, the red curve at the bottom right plot shows the upper terciles, the, the positive events, and they have especially high predictability for, you know, from the 1970s onwards perhaps and less so in the middle period. Whereas the negative NAO events are here indicated by the lower terciles curve, the blue curve, uh, it's perhaps a bit um, it's perhaps a bit mirrored in the sense that we hardly have any skill for the most recent decades, but more during the decades when the, the upper tercer hasn't. And then again, we have in the beginning of the century, it's, it's, it's neither nor, it's sort of a mixture. We, they, they, they co-vary quite, quite well in terms of the level of skill. So it's quite a complicated picture there, to be honest. Um, I'll jump over this here and um, just mention briefly that we did our work and then later I found this paper with Fletcher and Saunders that, that's quite old by nowadays standards, where they used a statistical, purely statistical approach to forecast the NAO in winter um, over basically the same period here, you see from 1971 in that case. Um, and they also used a running 30 year mean window to compute that. So quite similar in a way they, they, they produced these, these plots here for the correlation scale. And the interesting thing is, even though there's a completely, is a non-dynamical approach, statistical relationship um, between the subpolar temperatures in summer and the winter NAO. And they find similar interesting behavior that um, the skill 
you know, is reasonably high here at the in, in, in the most recent decades. And then they see a drop, the dash dotted line mostly here in the middle of the century. And then it also the statistical relationship recovers for the earlier parts of the century. So that that's an interesting indication that perhaps it's not all just a model thing, the behavior that we see in our NAO forecast, but um, there might be more to it. Okay. Um, we just to say, um, we, we then try to look at individual years which which contributed to most to this this correlation skill that we found in in our hind cars and um, this is an approach here where we try to quant quantify this so if you look at the way how the correlation coefficient um, is is computed you you, you, you I mean you know it's, it's it's basically a sum over contributions from individual years of the anomalies from the observations multiplied with the anomalies from, from, from the model, from the ensemble mean here. And um, this curve here that you see here, the black curve with the peaks, the arrows here, is, is basically only this product of the observed anomalies and the model anomalies computed, uh, plotted for every year. And the sum and then normalized with the variances is the correlation coefficient, which is the dash dotted um, horizontal line. But this way of looking at the correlation contribution of the covariances here um, enables us to indicate individual years that contributed most to, to the skill that we find. And, and, uh, and Geniotus is basically, most of the time is relatively moderate, but then you have a few peaks and these are interesting years where, where the skill peaks. And if we look at what happened in these years, so these are the five years that contributed the most that had these peaks, we see and we see that in out of these five years, in four of the winters, we had a strong positive Z500 anomaly over Greenland, which is associated with a negative NAO state. You can see that in the 1930s, 40s, um, 76, another winter, and uh, the, the winter 2009, 10, uh, sort of more, more recent one, people might remember. So these all contributed to, to these skillful predictions in the hindcast really but there's also one year as the strongest positive nao year that also was very well forecast in the model and and contribute to skill as well so again as i said it, the, the picture is a bit more complex it's not just the one phase it's it's probably the extremes that contributes from either phases to the skill and um and and, and uh, yeah show us so as the the overall skill behavior that we see, but you also see that they can be quite scattered across the century. So if we only look at the last few years and you, or the last say 30 years, we wouldn't, we would, we would get perhaps a picture that is not quite so representative. Um, I'd like to say a few words about the signal noise problem because that is um, that is important for the North Atlantic region. You have probably heard about the RPC and the ratio of the predictable component diagnostics, which is something the colleagues from the Met Office uh, came up with in a paper by Eid et al. in 2014. So they, they basically relate the predictable components um, in the observations to the predictable components in the model world. And this is done via this, this formula here. I don't really have much time to explain it, but there's lots of uh, literature and I have uh, references at the end as well. Um, the idea with this ratio is really that for a perfect model ensemble, we would have an RPC of um, one. So the, the, the predictable components in the, in the observations in the real world and in the model world would be similar. And if, if we have a situation where RPC is larger than one, then we have an over dispersive system that is showing under confidence, meaning that the model underestimates the predictability of the real world. And the opposite case where RPC is smaller than one, we're in a situation, we would be in a situation that, that we're quite familiar with from seasonal forecasting that we, uh, that we overconfident, we, we, we don't have enough spread in our system and the, um, the model predictability is, is perhaps indicating, is, is perhaps larger in, than in the real world. So what, what they described in that paper, Aid et al, um, 2014, is that they find regions in the North Atlantic here, indicated by these warm colors, red colors, where the predictable component of the observations is, is really quite a bit higher than the model's own predictable components. 
And there are several papers being written about this in, in the recent years, which, which are listed here. Question really is, this is a bit of a paradox um, because, I'll go back, uh, because this is not what we would expect that, that, that the model itself is, it can predict itself less well than it can predict the, the, oops, the, the, the observations. So um, where am I here? So how does that look like in our long hindcasts and what can we learn from those? We see here in, in blue and red, the curves, the, again, with a moving window computed, the RPC values in these long simulations for the NAO index. So the ratio of the predictable components. So around one, and this is where my dotted lines there is, this is the perfect model um, where, where the predictability in the real world and the model world are equal. And then we see some periods where this RPC is indeed larger than one, but also mine the large arrow bars, the gray, the gray lines there. But then we also see in the past, we see periods where it's very close to one around the mid century periods, uh, is, is, is not substantially larger than one. So from these long hindcasts, you end, you can estimate from the 110 years, the RPC value, you end up with a value of one near a nearly perfect one for the uncoupled simulation and roughly 20% above one for the coupled hind cast, which, which is nowhere near the, the two or three that, that is reported in some of the shorter seasonal hind casts from, from the metaphors, for example. So um, we would say that the predictable components of the observation in the model, they are not in disagreement if we look at it over a much larger sample size over the 110 years in, in these seasonal hindcasts. However, we should notice, uh, we should acknowledge that there is quite some substantial amount of not very well understood multi-decadal variability in the behavior there. And there's lots of um, activities and people are curious to try and understand what's, what's happening there. Um, if you look at, at this not only for an, an index and a time series of, of this index and behavior over time, but how that spatially, the, the, the spatial signature of it. We see here a way of doing this, and uh, there's more in this paper here, where um, we look at different periods, contrasting periods, so to say. For, for instance, if we go to the third row, uh, that looks at the period 81, 2009, this is sort of the most the more recent hindcast period. And on the left-hand side, we, we find our skill that I, similar to what I showed before, we have this sort of lack of skill over Europe basically. And um, on the right-hand side is the, the model predictability, the perfect model approach. And, and uh, it's, it's higher in, in that case here, that gives us this problem with the RPC. But then if we go back, for instance, to the period, uh, the row, above here, 42s, 1970. The picture is very different. So we, we basically have no skill in the areas uh, over Greenland and North Atlantic uh, at all. Whereas the model, uh, the perfect model approach is quite stable in time. You see that for the earlier periods as well. So it's much more robust and gives a much, much less variable, uh, basically a more robust indication of the predictability, whereas the observed predictability um, shows lots of variability also spatially over, over time here. So I'm um, here. Um, yeah. um, I don't know how much longer your presentation is. We would like to have some time for questions. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm very much aware that I, I I'd quickly, I jump over the slides. I just go through to the points where I want to say a bit more. Um, perhaps p a at one point, sorry, Judith, yeah. No, um, no, no problem. We find a very interesting behavior for the PNA skill as well. And uh, PNA is much more predictable for current decades, as you can see here. But then we see very, very similar behavior dropping to nearly negligible levels at all in the mid century period and recovering for earlier periods, for earlier parts of the century, which then uh, raises the question of like the link to ENSO. And um, I, I should say that I have a few plots here how ENSO was forecast there. but because I'm running out of time and I, I was expecting I was run out of time. I thought um, I, I talk separately about the ends of part of all this in the science workshop that will happen in the first week of August. So if any of you is, is more interested in the sort of multi-decadal predictability of ENSO and how that varies. And I, I would 
like to invite you to come to that talk where I'll focus especially on Enzo. Yeah, and, and um, just a very, very last point, because that would link with Anish's talk about stochastic parameterizations perhaps a bit and the role of stochastic forcings. Um, there was a very nice paper recently, uh, two papers basically by a group from Kiel in Germany, led by, or is, is a sort of Richard Greatbatch group, and these were two students in his group, Ole Wolf in GRL 2017 and Ole Rieke in Atmospheric Science Letters this year, where they looked at tropical forcing of the summer East Atlantic pattern. So it's, it's now it's, it's sort of different pattern, not the NAO, but summer East Atlantic. But um, especially this paper, the second paper here, looked at the non-stationarity of the link between the tropical forcing and this extratropical teleconnection. And they, they looked at, they find this multi-decadal variability, uh, a bit similar to what we see for the NAO. And they come up with a simple stochastic model, um, like linking the, the, the driver with the remote index and in, in sort of um, the, the, the tropical forcing and the, the remote index in the East Atlantic here. Um, and then by introducing some noise here and noise levels of um, really 0.2, quite, quite low, uh, enables them to, to end up with this multi-decadal fluctuations in skill, which is a nice way to, to try and think about uh, explaining these multi-decadal skill levels that we find uh, multi-decadal variability on skill. And with this, I really like to come to the conclusions. Uh, sorry, it took a bit long. Um, so I hope I could show you that these long seasonal hindcasts from 1901 to 2010, they provide a test bed for estimating seasonal predictability during distinct recent climate periods and I very much think that understanding the success and the limitations of predicting the past will increase our confidence in, in the future and the climate of the next 30 years very unlikely to be the same as the climate of the past 30 years, of course. So we found some evidence for multi-decade variability um, for both the extratropical and the tropical, didn't have time, but I can tell you it is, forecast skill with some pronounced drop of skill in the mid-century decades, but then again, higher levels of skill at the beginning of the century. And this skill uh, reduction cannot simply be attributed to poor observational coverage. Instead, we, we would hypothesize that changes in the predictability, they are linked to intrinsic changes in the coupled climate system, whatever that means really. But the, the, the main um, sort of conclusion from this is really that short hindcast periods are not representative for longer term behavior due to this decadal climate variability. And we, we suggest that the mid-century period stands out as an important period where we should perhaps test the performance of, of future seasonal forecasting systems a bit more. And um, yeah, once again, achieving good forecast skill for, for the past, for recent decades is not a sufficient, sufficient condition for guaranteeing similar good skill in the future. And with this, I'd like to finish and I have a few references here that maybe if, if, if these slides are shared, people could look up later. Thank you very much, Antje.